Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, wherever this finds you in the world. My name is Mark Canavera. I'm the Associate Director of the CPC Learning Network, uh, a policy practice uh, nexus housed at Columbia University with nodes and partners all over the world to advance the evidence base for children in adversity. And today we are very Delighted that our friends and colleagues at the World Bank have agreed to repeat a webinar that we were not able to record last time on some very cutting edge and important work that they've been doing, uh, especially around early childhood development. Uh, today we're going to hear from two people who have been working closely together and doing complementary work. Uh, Laura Rawlings is the lead social protection specialist at the World Bank. She works primarily in Africa on strengthening social protection and labor systems, but has also worked in the Latin American and Caribbean region, uh, where she led numerous project and research initiatives in the areas of conditional cash transfers, social funds, and social protection systems. She worked as the sector leader for human development in Central America, where she was responsible for coordinating the World Bank's health, education, and social protection portfolio. Uh, prior to joining the World Bank, Laura worked for the Overseas Development Council. She's an economist by training who has published very widely and is also an adjunct professor at George, Georgetown University School of Foreign Service in the Global Human Development Program. Laura is going to be the first speaker today and she's really going to set the framework uh, for uh, where this early childhood development work um, sits in human development and, and sh share some of the recent developments around that. After that, we'll hear uh, from Jeff Tanner, who is also at the World Bank and is a team leader for impact evaluations at the World Bank's independent evaluation group. He's worked on issues of early childhood development at the World Bank, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, and RAND for over a decade, beginning with the World Development Report in 2006. Uh, that was a report focusing on equity, and he wrote the chapter recommending early childhood development as a rare intervention that encourages both economic growth and shared prosperity. His lists of uh, research projects and evaluations is really quite extensive and impressive. He has completed two major systematic reviews of impact evaluation evidence from the developing world, uh, one on interventions to reduce maternal and child mortality, and another on the sustained effects of early childhood development, which is the one we're going to hear about today. And I think you're also going to enjoy some of the innovative ways that they're presenting these findings to make them very accessible. Uh, Jeff holds a PhD from the Rand Graduate School and an MPA in International Development from Harvard University. And uh, with no further ado, we will have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, to get started, I want to try to poll all of you and we will uh, launch a few polls just to get to know you as our audience. Um, you should see a poll on your screen now asking in what region do you uh, primarily focus your professional activities. If you um, could complete that, the poll is in progress. 30, 50 percent have voted, 63, 65, you're voting away. All right, um, with over 70 percent of the vote in, nearly 80, um, we can see that uh, we have a heavy Africa focus in this group of people, 52% of you uh, attending, focus your work on Africa, followed by 23% in Americas and the Caribbean, and about 20% in Asia and the Pacific. We're going to close this poll and move on to um, our next question, which is, which of the following best describes the institution where you work? Are you in an academic or research institute, a bilateral or multilateral aid agency with a government, an international NGO, or a local NGO? Take a few seconds to vote. We're over halfway through the voting process here. And it looks like as the numbers come in, we're a 
group that is uh, about half in international NGOs, maybe a little bit less, a quarter in academic and research institutes, 20% in aid agencies, and just under 10% at, at local NGOs. Uh, we will close that poll and move on to a third question, which is, what role best describes your own work? And this is for you, the attendees of this webinar, to answer. Are you in an advisory or technical role that also involves advocacy? Do you design programs? Uh, do you implement them? Or are you in evaluation? Please take a few seconds to complete the poll. This is very exciting. The first time we've gotten the polls right, so we will uh, try this again for our future webinars. But amazingly, you know, 56% of you are in advisory or advocacy roles and an additional third in monitoring and evaluation. And then smaller numbers for design and implementation. So I think um, we have a very technical group with us today. And I think uh, given that reality, you're all going to appreciate what we hear from Laura and Jeff. And a final introductory question for you all is, within this broader field of early childhood development that we're all interested in, what sector do you primarily focus on? Nutrition, education, health, child protection, or other? And we see the numbers streaming in and uh, have an interesting split about 40 some percent in protection, nearly 40 percent or a third in education, um, and followed by smaller numbers in health, nutrition, and other. Well, thank you for letting us get to know you a bit. I think that paints a very clear picture, given that we are the Child Protection and Crisis Learning Network. It's probably not surprising that we have a uh, an audience that is heavily focused on child protection technical skills. Uh, and with no further ado, we will turn the computer over to um, Laura and Jeffrey. Before they get started, just please do remember that um, you can always send us questions uh, in both the chat or the questions box uh, that should be part of your screen. And we will be monitoring that and have a healthy amount of time at the end for um, for questions. And, and Laura will moderate a discussion with Jeffrey. Lauren Jeffrey, are you ready to go over there? I think so. Can you see the PowerPoint? We can indeed. All right, then I think we're ready. Um, thank you very much, Mark, and uh, a pleasure to be with everyone and to uh, to be able to share with you this, this seminar today and some of our work. So I'll start for just a few minutes and then um, provide largely a framing and then turn to Jeff for um, the results of the, uh, of the systematic review. So I just wanted to share with you all a little bit um, of our perspective uh, here on some of the work going on in early childhood development. And uh, I wanted to share with you some, some of our perspective, which I know many of you share, about why the agenda uh, is so important in this area. And then second, um, share a framework from uh, a paper that we will, we will show you the link on this, but it's a short paper on Stepping Up Early Childhood Development, Investing in Young Children for High Returns, uh, which I had the pleasure to co-author um, with a number of my colleagues within the World Bank and outside the World Bank. Uh, and that's uh, a framework uh, that takes a life cycle approach as well as some principles. And in setting the agenda, I'll also update you all a little bit about uh, what's happening because it's very dynamic uh, in the World Bank today uh, with respect uh, to this agenda. So without further ado, um, let me go here uh, and let me just ask a quick question. Is there a way to get rid of that stuff to the right or not? Hang on, technical mm -hmm. issues. Maybe if we click on the screen. There. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, 
we're probably, as, as some people say, preaching to the choir here, but uh, you all, I'm sure, are convinced of the need for investing uh, in the early years and in early childhood development, uh, but a lot of people have not traditionally been as interested in this area, and a lot of the, the science, uh, the economic reasoning around rates of return are now complementing what's often um, the head side of the head and heart debate of people uh, you know, feeling intrinsically that there's, uh, there's a good reason to do this. Uh, so the way early childhood development is, uh, is conceived, at least here within our institution, is very much of as a holistic concept that refers to the physical, cognitive, linguistic, and socio-emotional development of young children. So being from pregnancy uh, until they reach primary school age. And what has captured many people's attention uh, as a common measure is the measure of stunting, which isn't the only outcome, obviously, that we're interested in. You'll hear a lot about that from Jeff and, and the systematic review. But it is a common one. And a lot of uh, not only chronic malnutrition, but uh, the associated uh, problems in development around these other areas, cognitive, uh, linguistic, and socio-emotional, are often, often we know, set in quite early uh, in life and are largely irreversible if not presented or addressed, especially um, in that critical window of opportunity of the first thousand days. So uh, these delays can become cumulative. Uh, they can become exacerbated uh, when young children are living in poverty or situations uh, of vulnerability and under stress. A lot of you work in the um, in the, uh, the child protection area. And as we know, um, these gaps do not narrow over time. Uh, and the best time to address them is that it is, is in the early years. Um, and particularly through combined interventions uh, that include not only nutrition, but also uh, early stimulation and learning. Uh, and on, on that note, the socio-emotional skills, or the non-cognitive skills as they're often called, acquired in early childhood through nurturing and reinforcing these positive opportunities to interact um, with adults and peers are predictive of success and productivity later in adult life. And if, for those of you who have not seen it um, last week, the Lancet uh, series just released uh, a number of essays that speak to this and really uh, drive this agenda home, and, and I would strongly uh, encourage all of you to read it. I haven't read it all myself, but it's there, and uh, this is very much the theme. And the evidence, um, which is in the, the publication that I'll present in just a moment, there's um, some of this, and of course a lot of evidence in what Jeffrey will present as well, but suggests that there are rates of return of about 7 to 16 percent annually from high quality early childhood development programs, especially those targeting vulnerable groups. Um, so this is an investment that makes sense um, uh, from an economic perspective, uh, among others. And as a result, um, early childhood development is durable, portable, and inalienable. Um, it's not something uh, like a road where if you invest in it and then you have to maintain it, it will deteriorate over time. It will, in fact, become cumulative over time. And, uh, and produce, uh, produce further gains. So it's, a, it's an exponent, uh, if you will, in, in the world of development. So even knowing all of this, um, too many children are falling through the cracks. 25% of all children under five worldwide are physically stunted. Um, about half of them live in Asia, uh, about a third of them in Africa. And uh, across all low and middle income countries, more than a third, so an even greater proportion there, of children under five are stunted. Um, also, less than half of three to six year old children in pre-primary school age are actually uh, engaged in any form of pre-primary education, be it formal or informal. And countries are under-investing in early childhood development. And again, this is this holistic concept of early childhood development, which includes maternal and child health, nutrition, early stimulation and learning, and social protection. Um, but often, it's a very small amount uh, between 0.1 and 0.2% of GNP on preschool education uh, and falls far below um, internationally accepted benchmarks for, um, for some of these investments. 
But the good news is that there is really a new momentum growing for investing in this area. Uh, one hallmark of this new momentum is the fact that there are early childhood development goals and the sustainable development goals um, established for 2030. Uh, notably target 2.2 on nutrition to reduce stunting by 40% by 2030 and target 4.2 on overall child development uh, to ensure that all girls and boys have access to quality early childhood development care and pre-primary education. So these are two obvious targets around early childhood development, but we should also recognize that investments in, in holistic early childhood development are actually very important inputs into reaching a number of the other SDG targets, um, which include the targets on child and maternal mortality, uh, it includes birth registration, violence prevention, and poverty reduction. And so within this, a range of partners, uh, including many of you, of course, uh, are showing a renewed interest in this work and in comprehensive approaches, which doesn't mean that uh, that you have to have packages where one agency does everything, but really mindfully putting together uh, these packages uh, across groups. And so let me just conclude this little section here by talking a little bit about what we're doing at the World Bank and mentioning some of these initiatives. Um, so the World Bank over the past 13 years has invested over $3 billion in 80 countries with a marked increase in the last two years and there's very much of an ambition now and a commitment to um, raise these investments and to continue investing a great deal and in fact there's a, a new uh, initiative uh, which I will uh, hold up in a minute when we turn back to the screens but it's called investing uh, it's okay I'll do it in a minute investing in the early years for growth and productivity and it's a commitment that the World Bank has made uh, to uh, increase the um, scale and scope of our investments uh, in this area of early childhood development and particularly around um, the pillars of ensuring that children are well nourished, especially in the first thousand days. Second pillar, that children are receiving early stimulation and learning opportunities. And the third, that children are nurtured and protected from stress. So through these areas, um, uh, the, the goal is that children reach their full potential with the physical, social, and emotional capacities to learn, earn, innovate, and compete. And that through this increased competitiveness and reduced inequality, uh, this is able to contribute to uh, the, the twin goals that we have at the World Bank of ending extreme poverty and boosting shared prosperity. So this is clearly uh, a multi-sectoral agenda, but it's one to which the World Bank has a renewed commitment to. In fact, only last week during uh, our annual meetings, we had a prime minister uh, from Tanzania as well as seven uh, ministers of finance getting up and pledging their country's uh, commitment to this agenda. And I have never in the decades that I've worked in this field seen ministers of finance pledging commitments uh, to early childhood development, but it, it, did, it did happen here last week. Um, so we've talked about the multi-sectorality. Jeff is going to present uh, what's an extremely compelling comprehensive review of, uh, of the work. Um, he will present the work on the systematic review on outcomes, but there's an accompanying uh, element that reviewed the World Bank's work on early childhood development. Uh, that also pointed to the need to invest in some of the areas that are now very much on the agenda. And then I just wanted to end by saying that um, the World Bank and UNICEF are also partnering and have launched um, the ECD Action Network, which uh, all of you are encouraged to join and learn more about. It encompasses uh, agencies as well as uh, development agencies, as well as non-government organizations, academia, and the philanthropic sector. So enough on the agenda and what we're doing at the World Bank. Let me quickly um, just run through the framework and principles in this uh, note, which you can all download, and uh, Mark will share the link uh, in just a few minutes when, when we're finished. Um, but this is a note that came out just a few years ago and uh, has been used quite a bit uh, to frame uh, some of this multi-sectoral work in early childhood development. 
Within the note, we identify 25 key interventions for young children and families taking a life cycle approach um, that, uh, that looks at those early years from pregnancy through um, to 72 months of age and covers a lot of the sectors in which uh, all of us work. Um, first in nutrition, second in health, third in water and sanitation, fourth in education, and fifth in social protection and outlines uh, in those areas and across those areas 25 interventions and looks at rates of return uh, on those interventions. Uh, it also identifies over time five integrated packages, again staying with this life cycle approach. The first being a family support package where there's parental support uh, for vulnerable families ranging from uh, family planning and birth spacing to maternal education to uh, cognitive stimulation and, and parenting practices to uh, a rights-based approach around parental leave uh, an adequate child care and uh, child protection regulatory frameworks to um, prevention and treatment of parental depression, which we know has a huge impact on child outcomes, um, to social assistance transfer programs and social protection programs more generally, especially for families in vulnerable situations. It also has um, an element uh, in the family support package for health, nutrition, and sanitation access for families. Uh, which pretty much speaks to itself, but also includes uh, micronutrient supplementation and fortification. The second package is the pregnancy package, uh, which includes antenatal care, uh, iron and folic acid, and counseling on adequate uh, diets. The birth package with attended delivery, exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of age, and birth registration, uh, very important for accessing services uh, and, uh, and engaging in the full rights of citizenship as children get older. Uh, the fourth is the child health and development package, which includes everything from um, immunization and deworming to the prevention and treatment of malnutrition, complementary feeding and adequate nutrition, therapeutic zinc supplementation also for diarrhea. And then finally, the preschool package, uh, which really encompasses the area of early childhood education. Uh, and uh, also aims to ensure continuity to quality um, primary schools. And across uh, these packages, there are really several um, actors and actions, and we outline in this note four principles. Um, the first one about conducting uh, diagnostics and establishing a strategy. Uh, for early childhood development within a country. The second principle is to coordinate and implement widely because this is not an agenda in a single sector uh, and uh, reaches across actors. The third, to integrate services to achieve synergies and cost savings uh, where needed. And the fourth, uh, to monitor, evaluate, and scale up, which many of you are interested in giving, given this audience. So with each of these, both the packages and the principles, we go into more detail in the note. And I also um, have included an annex in the PowerPoint that gives a little bit more of an overview of this. Um, then uh, the action uh, encompasses really uh, four pillars, advocacy through knowledge generation and sharing, financial and technical assistance um, with a focus on investments across sectors, building evidence on what works, which is where we'll hear from Jeff, and measuring ECD outcomes in the short, medium, and long term, because you always have to measure what you treasure, as they say. So let me um, say thank you here. Let me just um, end before passing to Jeff by saying, uh, repeating something that um, our World Bank President, Jim Kim, has been saying uh, particularly last week in the annual meetings, which is that these investments in early childhood development are a signature uh, development issue today, and particularly so that individuals, uh, countries, and societies can thrive in the 21st century. Uh, Blue-collar jobs are disappearing, and investment in neural infrastructure is going to become more important than investments in physical infrastructure when it comes to uh, high-performing countries, uh, high-performing jobs, and high-performing people reaching their full potential uh, in, in the 21st century and, and beyond. So uh, these investments are critical. They're critical um, for uh, not only uh, 
uh, individual productivity and because um, we all want to ensure a quality of opportunity, but they're also fundamentally linked to um, countries achieving their full capacity uh, for growth and development in the future. Thank you so much. And we'll pass it over to Jeff. We're just going to switch the PowerPoints around. Give us just a moment. And while they are switching, I noticed that there were a few raised hands. And um, we're not going to be passing the microphone to participants um, during this webinar. So I would just ask um, that you put your questions into the questions or the chat box, preferably the questions, but chat's also fine. And we've already had a couple of questions there and have included there a link to a page that's got all of the materials for this. And as Laura said, we'll put up some links at the end as well. Um, Jeff, back over to you. Great. Thank you, Mark. And it's always a, a thrill to present with Laura because she always has I feel like I always learn every time I, I sit with Laura in, in one of her presentations, even though I've been working on this for a while. Uh, it's fascinating stuff that, that the bank is doing, and this, this new initiative, it was so gratifying to sit there in that audience and hear these ministers of finance and the prime minister and the, the bank president all rally behind this issue um, that you know, Laura has been sounding on for, for a while, and uh, I'm, I'm newer to that party, but it, it, was, uh, it, it just gave you warm fuzzies all over, because we're... So the bank is finally moving in a direction to do the right thing in early childhood development. It's really thrilling, uh, uh, amplifying what, what uh, we've done. So let me tell you uh, a bit about uh, what this is. Um, we have, uh, as, as Laura mentioned, uh, IEG is the, the independent evaluation group. Our job is to look at what the World Bank does, and uh, we have an accountability function uh, which is trying to say, did the bank do what it set out to do? Are they accomplishing the goals that they have established for themselves? And uh, so we had an evaluation around early childhood development that was on that accountability function, did the bank do what it should do? We also have a learning function, which is where we try to say, what, what sorts of things should the bank be aware of or what things can we do better uh, for, for the bank and with the bank? And that's where this systematic review came in. And so this systematic review is much more on the learning side of trying to figure out what works in early childhood development. Now, as we started this out, um, we, we wanted to develop a systematic review, a new one, but there have been a lot of systematic reviews around early childhood development. And we scratched our heads for a while trying to think, well, where can we add value? And we saw that no one had actually assembled all of the evidence around the longer term or sustained effects of early childhood interventions. And this was uh, a little bit surprising because, of course, the, uh, the economic argument for investing in early childhood, as Laura mentioned, is that you have this window of opportunity where your investments just go farther. They, they do more in this very early period, so, so the argument goes. And so if that's true, then we should be able to see a really large rate of return later on. And, and Laura uh, quoted numbers of somewhere in the neighborhood of 7 to 16% per annum, which is just mind-blowing when you aggregate that over a lifetime. Uh, so, so there could be something really big here, but, but we saw that nobody had actually assembled the evidence on the long-term effects or, or effects of interventions that happen in the early childhood and effects that occur later on. And so we said, well, let, let's do this. Let's gather, gather all this together and see what we find in terms of the things that work and, and what works best. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we did for this systematic review and then what we found, and uh, perhaps most importantly, how you can use it. In terms of methods, systematic reviews are these uh, large, painstaking literature reviews on steroids, integrating meta-analysis and meta-regression uh, and, and other things along the way. They, they gain their uh, credibility from strong claims on comprehensiveness. So what we say is that we comb through all the available literature within the search criteria that we have, and we are reporting everything that meets the criteria that we have. So, so the inclusion criteria then become critical. So what are we talking about here? So we wanted to include all interventions from the bank or from outside of the World Bank that occurred during the early childhood period, so sometime between 
conception, and we said primary school enrollment or, or age six in the absence of, of information about primary school enrollment. And we wanted to look at all outcomes that occurred in that post-early childhood period. We collected the evidence uh, focusing on middle and low-income countries, this being the World Bank, we wanted to see what works well for, uh, for these contexts. It, we wanted it to be relatively recent, although if there were some, uh, some seminal pieces that occurred earlier than that, we would reach back uh, to, to pre-1990. Um, so our, we, we actually did this work, the search for this work in 2014. So there are a few more recent things that, that have come out. Uh, but those, by and large, corroborate what, what we're going to say here. In fact, uh, to my knowledge, there's nothing, there's no new evidence that, that would go against what, uh, what we have found. Um, and importantly, we look at impact evaluations that have a credible counterfactual or that passed a risk of bias assessment. So these provide the causal attributable measures of a project's outcome. So we're not just looking at correlations, but we need to really have this the study nailed down that causality in a way that, that we believe that the outcomes really are related to the intervention. Now this becomes especially important where we look at things uh, on a longer time scale, like we are explicitly doing with this systematic review, where we're looking at interventions occurring in zero to age six, but outcomes that can occur any time from age six onward. So we have some, uh, some people in some of the studies were up to 42 years old. So being able to nail down that causality becomes really important because in the intervening period, there's a lot of things that could have happened that could also explain the outcomes. And so what we're going to argue is that if the, so we, every impact evaluation that we have has an intervention that has a treatment group, and they also have a comparison group. That comparison group they need to demonstrate to us is comparable to the treatment group at the time of the intervention in every way, both observed and unobserved. If the only difference between these two groups is the intervention, and so if the only difference in the initial conditions between these groups is the intervention, and, and they are otherwise group-wise identical, now of course there are going to be individual people who are different, but as a group, their group averages in terms of their mother's education, uh, their family income, uh, uh, things that we can't observe as well as things that we can't observe, like their great-great-grandfather's genetic makeup, right? All of those things will be group-wise identical, and the only difference between these two groups is that one of them received the treatment. So the argument, the, the causal argument that is made is that if the only difference in the initial conditions is this one thing that you control, then any group-wise differences in the outcomes, no matter how far down the line you look, is also attributable to that one difference in the initial conditions. So, doing all that, we resulted in 115 uh, potentially relevant studies. Those were whittled down to 54 that passed the risk of bias assessment. And those 54 studies from 24 projects in 21 countries then become our data set. Now in terms of scope, we look at six domains of human development outcomes. Physical development, so uh, along, uh, along stature and other anthropometrics, cognitive development, linguistic development, socio-emotional, schooling uh, uh, development, and labor market outcomes. We also paid particular attention to three factors that can interact with or influence those outcomes, being gender, socioeconomic status, and uh, time, time period, or, or how long the intervention was available and how long afterwards are we looking. Um, we found uh, some things that confirmed our priors and some things that were surprises, and we'll, we'll save those surprises for just a moment. But things that, that confirmed our priors, these are things that we sort of thought were true going into it, and turns out that, that yeah, we find good evidence on it. First, on uh, things that affect cognition and cognitive development. We found that early stimulation was highly effective for most measures of cognitive development. By early stimulation, we mean uh, structured interactions with the child in a way that is going to stimulate their, their brain and their problem solving. Um, conditional cash transfers, deworming and breastfeeding also improved general cognition. For linguistic outcomes, we see early stimulation again as well as conditional cash transfers and for schooling, those two in addition to preschool. Again, these aren't terribly surprising, 
but it's really nice that you find evidence that confirms what you thought should be true. Um, for uh, on, 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 in terms of the uh, the influencing factors, socioeconomic status, uh, it turns out that children from poorer families benefited incrementally more. Also, children with more educated mothers were also more likely to benefit. Now, that latter is sort of expected. Uh, the former is kind of a, uh, the former that children from poorer families benefited more is one that we would certainly hope is true, and it was really nice to see this. Nice. There actually evidence that that this is in fact true. Um, because sometimes we worry that children from wealthier homes are just going to soak up all, all the benefits. What we think is going on here is that these kids from the poorer homes are starting from such a lower base that when you compare them to other kids from poor homes, there's a lot more ground that they can make up. Um, in terms of interventions, uh, as we saw, really stimulation works for most outcomes most of the time. There are a few exceptions, but, but really this is a, an incredibly robust intervention type, that it really does seem to work for almost everyone almost all the time. Uh, obviously, if you really tried hard, you could do it wrong, but it, it seems to be pretty robust across contexts and, and time periods. Health and social protection is also fairly robust. Uh, and uh, we, we found in terms of time that earlier starts and longer exposure are associated with better outcomes. I'll, I'll let that sink in for a minute. Again, this is something that would make sense once you see it but it's nice to find the evidence that starting earlier and having people exposed to the programs longer uh, does better. And we'll get back to that in just a moment. Now, there were a few surprises. Uh, first, we found that early stimulation, in fact, can improve labor market outcomes. Now, when you, when you think about this, this is actually uh, a really happy surprise, right? That you can, you can work with a kid when they are 18 to 36 months old um, with early stimulation and then go back and look uh, 20 years later, and when they're 20, what is it, 20, 21, 22 years old, uh, we're finding, finding a 25% bump in their wages. Now, if you could do something for your kids that would result in an, a quarter of their, their wages added on top of it, that's a, a, almost a no-brainer, right? So this is really uh, pretty terrific that we can show evidence on this. Um, we also see that we, on the flip side, we don't yet know how to sustain physical benefits beyond early childhood. So, so for, for nutrition especially, we, we see that we can, we can do a lot and those nutrition interventions will really affect kids in those early periods, but by the time they get to age six and seven, eight, those effects are, are by and large washing out. Now there is some mixed evidence on height and uh, stature, but it's, the, the evidence there is, I, I say it's mixed because we tried to disaggregate it in a number of different ways, we couldn't find any real pattern for why sometimes height effects might stay and sometimes they, they don't. Um, and so we're, we're sort of saying that overall, we, we don't really see that. Uh, socio-emotional effects, interestingly, tend to lag. So we, we don't see a lot of socio-emotional effects in the, uh, in the sort of this primary school age period, but we do see that in adolescence. So we see a, a peak in, in socio-emotional effects. These are actually sort of uh, insulating effects. The kids don't go you know, up the deep end or, or have negative uh, socio-emotional socio challenges um, if they have been exposed to, especially to early stimulation um, and also to, to some uh, child protection and caring. Uh, this sort of makes sense. We all remember our own adolescence, which was a, a fairly emotional time. And if you can sort of mitigate the, the peaks yeah. and, and valleys in that, then you're probably better off, right? Um, but interestingly, those effects tend to fade as uh, kids age into adulthood. Most outcomes were gender neutral, um, and that boys and girls are benefiting about the same. However, uh, early childhood interventions are particularly impactful for girls' schooling, which was a, a, an interesting one, and one that obviously the World Bank cares about quite a bit. Deworming can improve both cognition and language. And if you think about that for a moment, why on earth, what, what's the pathway there, right? We would expect deworming to be able to affect perhaps stature or height or, or height for age kinds of measures. Uh, but the fact that it can affect cognition and language means that it is interacting with the body's ability to absorb micronutrients in a way that is feeding the brain better, and so the brain can then take advantage of the stimulation, schooling, and other things that is around it. Um, so that was uh, really quite interesting. Um, if there's interest, uh, over the summer we had a, a, a big brown bag uh, lunch here at the World Bank on the worm wars, 
um, where uh, uh, Owen Osher and uh, David Evans sort of uh, rolled down all the evidence on on, on deworming and, and what effects does it actually have. Uh, somewhat uh, controversial, but uh, the evidence that we see is uh, we, we think is pretty solid. Nutrition, um, and this is a big point. Nutrition needs to be supported throughout and beyond the first thousand days to have any lasting effects. Uh, and so this is when so Laura pointed to the, uh, the the point about early early childhood being durable, um, and we see that that is true for for most outcomes. However, uh, with physical development outcomes, as we saw earlier, those are perhaps not as durable. But you know, physical development, height, uh, height, height for age, weight, uh, those may not matter so much. Those, those aren't intrinsically important outcomes. The only thing intrinsically important about physical development, uh, the you know, potential outcome, is that um, there is some evidence that women who are taller have an easier time giving birth. And so this, there may be an effect on maternal mortality or neonatal mortality. But that's the only thing where, where physical development itself is intrinsically important. Otherwise, it's very instrumentally important and that it tells us a lot about other things that we care about because we know that stunting tends to go along with, uh, with cognitive, uh, lack of cognitive development. But I want to talk about these nutrition interventions for, for just a moment um, and the, the question on durability. So nutrition is one that we, the, the bank and others do a lot of and we think is very important and for good reason. And so we were really surprised by this result. Um, looking at this slide, on the left hand, leftmost side of the panel, you see the golden bars indicating where, uh, when in a child's early childhood period an intervention took place. And we're listing the different kinds of interventions that we have here, be it breastfeeding, supplementation for mom, supplementation for baby, um, or other sorts of things. In the middle of that panel, you see the age at which the, the, the kids were evaluated. So when did we follow up? And then on the right hand side, you see the effects of, of the intervention at that follow-up age. Things in gray are things that are not effective. And so we see a whole lot of gray matter over there. Um, we, we see that there is, we, we can't find a sustained effect on physical development from, from nutrition. We can't find, can't find a sustained effect of nutrition on cognitive or linguistic or socio-emotional or schooling outcomes by and large. But there is one exception. And the only exception is also the only intervention that intervened throughout this, the entire period of zero to age three. And that is the INCAP nutritional intervention in Guatemala. And it's also the one where we're looking the farthest out. So at age 33, on average, some of these kids in that data set are 42 years old. We find really strong, very large effects on cognition, on reading, and on girls' schooling. And that's really quite remarkable. One, that, that in order to, to have nutrition work, what we've learned is that nutrition needs to be done throughout this entire period. Going in piecemeal at different periods just doesn't work, at least in the long term. It can work in the short term, but those effects will fade. Um, and only if it's done over this entire period can you get those effects to really last longer into, into adulthood, which is really ultimately what, what uh, we care about, I think, or a big part of what we care about. Um, and so nutrition can work if done in a specific kind of way. Put another way, let me uh, show this. Um, so this is a forest plot. Uh, we have a, a technical audience here, so we decided to, to throw in this slide. Um, on the left-hand side are the different countries and specific outcomes that were being measured for all the, the various different nutrition interventions that I just noted. Um, and in there you see uh, some stuff, these are the individual, so we have multiple measures even per intervention. And even when you look at things like height in, in the middle uh, in, in Gambia, or height measured in Belarus, or height measured in Jamaica, you look at on the right hand, uh, or sort of the middle section of that panel where you have the whisker plot, uh, all of those effects are crossing that zero line. In, indicating that they are not statistically significant. When we group these by outcomes, so we have the physical outcomes are grouped at the top, then cognitive, language, socio-emotional, and schooling outcomes. The only ones that have an effect 
over all of those are the ones coming from this Guatemala study. Um, so this is pretty compelling evidence, and again, going back, that Guatemala was also the one that was in this entire period of zero to age three, that if we're going to do nutrition, we kind of know the way to do it, that this is the way to do it. And if we don't do it this way, it's not as likely to be effective. In fact, we can't find any evidence yet that doing anything but the first thousand days will have later effects on any outcome. Uh, so I, I think that's quite remarkable. Um, so uh, reiterating this, key intervention should be sustained throughout the first thousand days. We look at, at time in, uh, in, in particular. We talked about nutrition. We see some similar outcomes with water and with healthcare um, are also more beneficial if those are implemented in zero to three. So in both of those cases, one is in Bangladesh and the other is in China, uh, so water for China and uh, healthcare for Bangladesh, we see that the exact same intervention coming in when a child is zero to three has a much larger effect, in fact has an effect, and the effect is quite large if it's in for the zero to three versus if the exact same intervention comes in at ages three to six. So this zero to three period, so, uh, and Laura noted the, the first thousand days, mm -hmm. really is a, a critical period here. Um, uh, we, so, so far, uh, or, or, or previously, this is coming from the, uh, uh, the, the broad arithmetic evaluation, Latin America and the Caribbean had done a really good job um, emphasizing childhood interventions for those younger than three, and so it's, it's incredibly gratifying to see the bank now turning and emphasizing that for, for everyone. Uh, it's terrific. So, how can you use this systematic review? So in the, uh, in the PowerPoint which I have, there is, there is an annex uh, to it which goes through a case of how you might think about using the systematic review uh, in, in your own work. Um, your mileage may vary, but you can use this to decide which interventions to do and then design that chosen intervention. We went to a lot of trouble to include a whole bunch of appendices and cross-references uh, and, and summaries to really put as much information in, in here as we could. So all the sections are, are cross-reference. So sections are, are like we have the physical development, cross-reference with cognitive development, cross-reference with everything else that we have in there, and cross-reference when we talk about uh, time and, and timing, uh, those are all cross-references as well. We have chapters organized by outcome domain and by subcategories and by intervention types. Each one of those has tables with forest plots like the one that you just saw, and each one also has a vignette where we describe in more detail a particular intervention that has really good impact evaluations over a period of time. And we can track what's happening with the outcomes and with these kids over time in those vignettes. We have gap maps where we look at the intervention by outcome space and by regions um, to say what still needs to be done, where we have evidence and where do we not have evidence. We list uh, challenges and suggestions for doing this type of work. And we have a, a, a bumper crop of appendices um, where we look at uh, details of all these interventions by country, describe how they were done, what were the implementation status, was it implemented well or poorly, what are the, the challenges, the details on the outcome instruments, so what particular instrument are they using, like in cognitive development, are they using a raven, are they using a, a piece or something else. Um, we also include an anthology of other early childhood development systematic reviews, so if there are other particular questions that you want to look at in a different time period, if you want to look at evidence, say, on nutrition during the early childhood period. We have references for that. Uh, and the list of, also have a list of impact evaluations that didn't quite pass the quality rating. So if you know, well, my favorite impact evaluation wasn't included, then that would have changed things. We go in there and we tell you, well, was it included or was it not? And then we also on the web have our full coding database with more information than, than uh, you could ever want. Um, a little bit more on how you can use it. I want to just briefly go over some of the gaps. Gap map by region. So these are, this is looking at the world and where did the studies come from? Where do we have good evidence on the long-term effects of early childhood interventions? And it looks like Latin America is reasonably well covered, at least by, by comparison. And if you look at the, the bar charts up, up there at the top, uh, you see that uh, in, the, in the central bar chart, you see, or the one on the right, you see that Latin America and Europe and Central Asia are really well covered. Now, for LAC, that coverage is, does a pretty good job of being across most of the continent. Most countries have some intervention that they can call on for, for their own evidence. But in ECHA, even in Europe and Central Asia, even though those areas are, are 
is well covered by number, those are just coming from two countries. And so there's a lot more work that needs to be done in Europe and Central Asia. Far more, though, in a place like the Middle East and North Africa, where there is absolutely zero causal evidence on the long-term effects of early childhood interventions from those areas. So policymakers in those areas are, in some sense, they're winging it. They're, they're going by correlational studies, which can be incredibly instructive, but ultimately aren't causal and aren't local. Um, and so if we think that there are questions of external validity, this is a, a, something to be concerned about. We also see that there are only three impact evaluations for India and China combined, which cover, what, uh, fully 40% uh, or so of the world's population and, yet, uh, and, and far more of the world's children. Um, and yet only three impact evaluations coming out of uh, those areas. We see Africa, where it is covered, is covered on the coast, but really nothing on the interior. And, oh, and I should also say that most of the evidence that we have is really from the upper and middle income countries, uh, and hardly anything at all from the lower or lower middle income countries. And in terms of gaps by outcomes and by intervention, so the bank has twin goals. Our goals are to reduce poverty and increase shared prosperity. It turns out that there's really not a whole lot of evidence on those things. Um, in fact, less than half of the impact evaluations explore the, the effects on shared prosperity or where they're disaggregating by gender or by parents' income or by something else that would be important to, to look at whether or not this prosperity is shared. And there is only one impact evaluation of all of these that measures the effect of early childhood development and its potential on reducing poverty. And that was by measuring the impact of early childhood development uh, interventions on the later jobs and incomes of those beneficiaries. And so that will have an intergenerational transmission in reducing poverty. Uh, we also see a, a number of interventions that just weren't measured. And so there is only one study on the sustained effects of water on sanitation or on hygiene interventions. And there's little to no evidence on the long run benefits to children from common maternal interventions um, as, as well as uh, those that are sort of outside of the traditional early childhood sectors. So there's nothing on nutrition counseling, for example, nothing on prenatal visits and the benefits of prenatal visits, and nothing on food security, which is of particular interest to this audience, right, where we're, we're really concerned about uh, security and, and risk. So nothing on food security there. There was only one intervention, a lot of studies on it, but one intervention uh, that was studied for breastfeeding, uh, one in Belarus, which is a fantastically well done study, gives us a lot of, in, a lot of information, but it's still ultimately in one place. Uh, family planning and good governance suffer from a similar paucity of data. Um, if you are an impact evaluator or you know one, uh, tell them to, to look at this chart. This tells us uh, where we have evidence and where we still need it in the intervention by outcome space. Um, so Laura mentioned uh, the, the 25 key interventions. And what we tried to do here is we tried to map those key interventions and say, well, where do we have evidence on the long-term effects of those interventions? Uh, the more deeper color, the square there, the, the more evidence that we have. And so you see that there's a lot of potential work to be done, it's still an exciting area to, to delve into. Um, summing up, so we, we did this systematic review of all the credible impact evaluation evidence, the causal evidence on the effects of early childhood interventions, so things happening in the early period, on the later life outcomes, and so only looking at outcomes from age six or uh, primary school enrollment onward. We found that early stimulation works, social protection and health often, but not always, do too. Nutrition and other interventions really need to be uh, happening in that and throughout that first full 1,000 days, um, and you know, some, some measure of 1,000 days from conception on. Here we had to, we, we actually measured it from birth onward. Sustaining uh, improvements to physical development is tough, but it might not matter because we can do it for cognition, and it's the cognition uh, uh, improvements that are really going to affect children's livelihoods later on. The poor most often benefit. This has implications for or perhaps against targeting. Um, and how do we use it? Uh, how, or how can you use it? Uh, you can use it to try to decide between interventions which ones you should try to do. Or if you're trying to design a selected intervention, uh, it can also help you to decide where we need more evidence. 
um, as one of the uh, the pillars that uh, Laura discussed. And there are uh, we we try to give rich resources done from multiple angles, so you can see exactly what we did, come to your own conclusions in your particular area. Things may vary. Um, and so, lastly, I'll just say mind those gaps that we have. Um, uh, going from surviving to thriving will require doing things a little bit differently, uh, leveraging existing childhood entry points, actively engaging parents and allies, building on this experience of uh, early interventions. Thanks. Thank you so so much for that, Jeff. And um, <clears throat> I've I've personally seen this presentation in a couple of different iterations, and I do learn new things every time. This was the first time my attention was drawn to the fact that here you have the country of China, which has hundreds of millions of children, and we have one little study there. And I just think, you know, even though we are um, <clears throat> in a sounder place on the evidence for early childhood, there is still a lot of work to do. And um, I would recommend that all of the participants take a look at <clears throat> the handouts that are included in the sidebar. And we will, as a follow-up to this webinar, send out an email with all of the, um, with a link to all of the, the materials here. But if you go to the, East, the documents the PDFs called ECD infographic. There are outcomes, knowledge gaps, and nutrition benefits. Each one of those is a very visually compelling um, summary of what they learned through that very rigorous process that Jeff just described. And uh, our webinar guru, Yana Maevskaya, who's here, is originally from Belarus and was very um, proud to see the strong evidence coming out of there. I'm going to run two more polls, but please take this opportunity to send your questions to Laura and Jeff um, using the questions box or the chat box. Um, this is the moment to do that. I think it's very obvious from the, the two presentations that you're in the presence, uh, even if it's virtual presence, of two very uh, sophisticated thought leaders in this field. And so I hope that you will um, bring some provoking questions to them, thought-provoking questions and maybe provocative questions. Um, while you do that, I'm also going to run the last two polls that follow on to um, the, the presentations. Having heard what you've heard and learned what you've learned, um, here is the first poll for you. In your opinion, which of the outcomes, and these are um, outcomes at the, the child level, need further study? Uh, language outcomes, cognitive outcomes, socio-emotional outcomes, schooling and education, or physical outcomes. Please take a few minutes to vote, but also be typing your questions into the questions box. We have, how is the answering going? Nearly half, all right, we've just crossed the halfway mark for the voting. Nearly, we're at two-thirds now. Anyone else would like to vote? Um, you know, with two-thirds of you voting now of 70%, you know, there is a clear majority here for um, social, socio-emotional outcomes. And I, I'd be curious to hear if Jeff and Laura would agree with that assessment. Um, it rings true with my own experience, but my own experience is clearly anecdotal. I'm going to close this poll now. We do have about three-fourths of you voting on that and see a 63% social and emotional uh, preference for learning and 25% for schooling. Our last poll for you all is, in your opinion, which activities, and these are activities that can be done to promote our early childhood development, need further study? Nutrition, education, health, child protection, and by child protection, I think we mean the uh, sense of protecting children from violence, exploitation, and abuse, um, or other. And we have a 
tremendously biased crowd here at the CPC Learning Network. At the beginning I said we're the Child Protection and Crisis Learning Network, but at our founding we were also the Care and Protection of Children Learning Network. So amongst this child protection heavy crowd, 73% of you, eight, nearly 80% have voted, and there's an 81% preference for more activities that need further study. Um, that are protection activities. So that is no surprise to me, given who our audience is. Um, and I uh, uh, will now close this poll and bring the first couple of questions to Laura and Jeff. Um, are there any interventions or considerations of infants and toddlers? Um, mental health is the first question from, uh, excuse my pronunciation, Aurea Maria Vericat Rocha. Um, and I would, I would add uh, an additional question uh, for both of you, which is linked to what you mentioned about the first having uh, finance ministers involved in this conversation for the first time. Um, you know, what I understood from the presentation this time was that the linkage between early childhood and development and poverty reduction, which is a, you know, difficult thing to measure and a, and a, pretty long stretch, you know, you would need a very rigorously designed study to look at those two things, is, is pretty embryonic. And what more would you like to see in that field to make a stronger case uh, for the linkage between early childhood development and poverty reduction? Laura and Jeff, over to you. And please keep the conversation going and I will just chime in with questions um, as they arise. Um. So, uh, 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 very, very quick answer from my side. Laura will have uh, far more interesting things to say on, on those two questions. Um, the, uh, so, ask if any intervention on uh, infant and toddler or any uh, information on infant and toddler mental health. So, our systematic review wasn't looking at effects on infants and toddlers. It was looking at interventions for them and then the effects of those interventions for, for infants and toddlers later on. Um, there, uh, there is, so yeah, there is a, a study in Romania um, that uh, was, that sort of looked, looked at things around this, this issue of, of intervening for, for people in this age group. It was, a, it was a, an orphan adoption program, so it sort of fell under the, the social protection and child support. Um, and it sees really, really large effects of, of that later on. Um, but in terms of, of specific interventions for that, I'll, I'll kick that to Laura. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. I, uh, I, I'm sure there are good interventions out there and, and that it's well known. And in fact, maybe, maybe the person who put the question forward has something in yeah. mind, which is the case, in which case we would love to hear from you. Um, I want to just reflect for a moment that actually um, this question is very interesting because it relates back to the poll outcome about being uh, very interested in outcomes related to socio-emotional development because that's clearly the area where we uh, do not have a standard set of metrics or as good an understanding. You all are clearly a very informed uh, group about, uh, about how well those are measured. So. Um, both the question on mental health interventions and then the, the poll results on these socio-emotional outcomes I think are quite related. So uh, I would be curious to hear, I'm not an expert on infant toddler mental health, I would be curious to hear from the person who posed the question, but I do want to just reflect that um, a lot of the, uh, I think the interesting work going on today operationally in terms of the types of interventions being designed has a lot to do um, with this field, right? So it's around looking at building on uh, some of the basic interventions, which we often think of as being, for example, in the UNICEF Care for Child Development Package, and then combining those with, for example, um, behavioral interventions related to parenting or a strong focus, some work we're currently involved in in Rwanda, uh, on violence prevention and really working with families um, around 
how to have a more healthy home environment with respect to, to violence prevention uh, within the family and, in, and including with children. So I think that, uh, that the field is clearly much more cognizant of the importance of these types of interventions which are, which are quite related when you think about sort of the causal logic of, um, of what's going to impact infant and toddler mental health. Um, uh, it, it's, it's becoming more and more cognizant of, of these areas and this type of work. Um, on the second question, um, Mark, that you put forward about uh, that causal chain between early childhood development interventions and poverty reduction and how that's embryonic uh, and, and what do we need to do to think more about that, I, I would point out two things. Um, one, and I will share the link with Mark so that you can see our little uh, infographic, which I'll hold here closer to the camera, but this is what we came out with, oops, wrong way, um, for the annual meetings um, about investing in the early years, and you will not be able to see this, but we'll share it. This is the, the causal framework that I was mentioning before, which does start um, with a series of interventions ranging from um, nutrition and dietary diversity to um, health care, reproductive health services, water and sanitation, female empowerment, family leave, reduced income poverty, safety nets, a number of interventions which are um, in fact closely related to those 25 key interventions that, that I talked about and then through this causal logic um, with children uh, being, being nourished and having basic health, um, the early stimulation and learning, and the nurturing and protection um, allows them to reach their full potential, which increases uh, competitiveness, reduces inequality, and that can lead to, um, to poverty reduction. So, you know, this is just one shot, if you will, at some of that causal logic, but it, it is important to think through these things um, on a program level, on a national level, and, and to really uh, spell that out in terms of the, the logical thinking. And what we need more of, and Jeff's going to like this a lot, uh, in terms of proving those relationships are, in fact, long-term studies, right? We need strong evidence that, um, that actually will show what are uh, the rates of return and the contributions to poverty reduction from these early interventions. So it's very exciting that in, in several countries um, the research has been taken quite seriously and there now are uh, data pointing to some of these returns. And it's yeah. very important, particularly when you were able to follow uh, these cohorts that receive these interventions in the early years up until adulthood and start looking at labor market outcomes, mm -hmm. right? And I know you didn't have a lot in your study, but you right. had a few, right. and it's good stuff, it's right? It's yeah. fascinating yeah. and really nice to look at. And it's it, what I find fascinating also is it's not just uh, on their earnings or income, which is very important, but there are all these, um, I wouldn't want to call them corollary effects. There, there are other effects as well that have strong economic impacts um, in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, some of the recidivism rates, uh, you right. know, right. less likely to be uh, right. to so be in, in jail, socio-emotional outcomes. Right. So those are also Excellent. can be very, very beneficial broadly to poverty reduction or, or to savings. Right. Right. Yeah, even uh, impacts on unemployment and employability, right. right, are there. So just having a job, you're far more likely to have a job uh, having been through these these early stimulations, it's just fascinating to think that in this this period when you're so young, right, a child is so young that you can trace out and and find those effects later on. Uh, it's it's thrilling and it's so promising. Exactly. So, please more of it and <laughs> follow follow um, follow people over the longer term, which I know can be difficult, but it points to the importance of uh, of doing doing this longer term work. I want to quickly go back and supplement my answer on uh, interventions in infant and toddler mental health. Um, in, in our systematic review, uh, if you look at uh, table 4.1, uh, when you, because I know you'll all download it and <laughs> read it religiously, I'm going to help you out. So table 4.1 is a table that uh, gives, studies, uh, gives studies, countries, average age at the intervention, uh, the, the intervention that was evaluated and the reviewed outcomes and, and the effects of that. And we see that in, in that period of sort of zero to age three, uh, we have, it looks like, probably 10 or so different types of interventions, uh, ranging from breastfeeding promotion, micronutrient, supplemental feeding, 
to stimulation, uh, quality early childhood uh, and, and pre-primary programs. And we look at the effects of, of those, and conditional cash transfer, we look at the effects of those on socio-emotional outcomes. And so we see, for example, that the early stimulation uh, in Jamaica, that, that study had really large effects for 17, 17 to 18 year olds on reducing their anxiety, reducing their attention deficit, reducing their depression, and increasing their, their self-esteem, as an example. Um, very interesting. And Aurea Maria, apologies again for the pronunciation. If you um, have examples of interventions that you'd like to share, um, please do send them in and we can share them with the group. And Laura mentioned we'd be very interested to hear about them. We have a very technical question um, that I think is an interesting one from Liliana Ponguta. Uh, again, I apologize for all pronunciations between now and the end of the webinar. Um, <clears throat> her question is this, how do we reconcile the findings that health interventions do not have sustained impacts with the many studies showing that early life adversity is associated with metabolic and many other diseases later in life? And that, I believe, is um, the the early, the adverse childhood experiences studies that Liliana is referring to there among others. Um, in other words, and this is Liliana's words again, is it that the interventions are not targeting the quote unquote correct pathways or are the in impact evaluations not looking at the right outcomes? Um, well, in terms of are the, are the impact evaluations not looking at the correct outcomes, um, that's Perhaps for, for you to judge, as, as the reader, we, we list all the outcomes that they measure in there and, and you can see are they measuring the, the right ones or would you rather that they measure different ones. And if you'd rather that they measure different ones, then this gives you a great platform on which to say, this is what's been measured, we really need to measure that. So make that case, use this and, and make that case if we need to, to measure things differently as, as a community. Um, how do we reconcile those two things? Man, that's, that's a question that we really struggle with. Uh, and we spoke with uh, a, a number of, of uh, I, I won't use anyone's name because I don't want to incriminate them. We, we talked to a lot of guys who have, who have been doing this for a long time and say, how do we, uh, how do we reconcile these things? And the, I, I think that, look, there, there's no question that having, uh, you mentioned the adverse childhood experiences study, uh, having those types of experiences when someone is young undoubtedly leads to those later effects. Um, but what we do about it is something different. Um, and we, we often find, and, and this is maybe one of the points of the, the nutrition uh, piece that I shared, that those interventions, maybe they're not doing quite the right thing. Maybe they're not, not doing it for as long as it needs to be done or in the way that it needs to be done or in the time frame that it needs to be done. And so we're not saying that, it, that you can't affect those things. And we're not saying that those uh, effects of those negative experiences don't exist. What we are saying is that we don't have evidence yet that can convince us that we know how to do it right, how to change it. Exactly. So we need more interventions and more studies so that we know if it's actually working. No, I really have nothing to add to that, just to reiterate. Um, we know the problem exists and we know it's severe. So particularly what you're talking about, some of the, the latest research that I'm sure you're familiar with, Liliana, on toxic stress, the effects on uh, early brain development, on um, neural connections, uh, all this scientific literature that's coming out now uh, points very, very clearly to that problem uh, existing and manifesting itself early on. So we know the problem is there. We don't necessarily know what the solutions are, right? right. I mean, that's what it boils down to. So the importance of continuing um, to try to find those solutions and to evaluate um, their effectiveness, be it with existing measures or be it with others. Um, and, you know, things are becoming much more sophisticated now with the way you can test for a lot of these things, um, you know, even through saliva and hair and all these other areas right. when, when you're talking about uh, the effects of, of adversity yeah. actually on these uh, measured uh, outcomes. Um, Skin electroconductivity. Exactly. Is there is that one you've yeah. seen exactly, and I was reading about a, a saliva test mm -hmm. recently that you can do. So, so there are 
there are new measures, A, so maybe we haven't looked at it more fully, um, but, uh, but clearly in terms of what has been looked at so far as with what Jeff was pointing out, is that it's, it's very well established that the problem exists, but it's not as well established that we know much about the solutions, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of work to right. be done. Right. I think that's a really great question and just a terrific answer as well. And um, I'm appreciative to all of you for asking it that way. We have another question from Mamiki Kamanakao. Uh, considering the high rate of teenage pregnancy in some African countries, and I would add in many parts of the world, uh, why do we have? Why are we targeting early childhood development uh, from the moment of pregnancy and not uh, starting with adolescence? Isn't it too late by the time somebody's already uh, pregnant? And that is quite a philosophical question, but one that I hope that we've um, considered. It's it's a great question, and it's interesting. Maybe we need to frame the dialogue a bit differently. Uh, I think since we're looking at all these outcomes with children, we start with pregnancy because that's where the kids themselves start. But clearly, maternal and child health, uh, birth spacing, uh, waiting until an appropriate age to, to get pregnant, all of that has tr tremendous outcomes, uh, or tremendous influence, I should say, on the outcomes then measured in children. So. Um, Maybe it's a communication issue. I don't think anyone means to suggest that we shouldn't look at uh, mothers, mothers' health, um, and issues of, of teen pregnancy, anemia, birth spacing, uh, a lot of that, uh, and, and the age of the mother as very, very important factors. No, absolutely. Um, the, the, the reality is that, yes, uh, your so in part of part of the so one model of the intergenerational transmission of poverty, right, is that your your own experiences are passed on to your kids through a number of different pathways. Um, either if you are a mother, there is a a very mechanical physical pathway where you are not able to physically give them the same benefits. Uh, if you yourself went through toxic stress, or if you're uh, if if you are malnourished, you you yourself. Um, there are a, a, any number of other pathways, and we, we always talk about you know, our, our favorite regressor whenever we do uh, uh, menstrual regression, and we're looking at the effects of wages, is mom's education, right? Because always. we know that, mm -hmm. that, that, that moms have, have this important factor. But the, the reality is for these types of studies is that nobody is looking at that in a rigorous, empirical way. Nobody is looking at, okay, let's have an effect for, for teens, or adolescents, and then let's look at the effect on their children later on. I think it's a brilliant study. And Mamik, if you want to develop that study, or if you have a great intervention that you want to do that with, come talk to me, and maybe we can develop something and, and study it. I think it would be absolutely fascinating. Um, but but we, we don't have that now. However, what I will say is that, except for, for, for a few outcomes, now we, prior to this systematic review, we did another one on the effects of any intervention that can affect maternal or child mortality. And in that one, we, we did look at all sorts of interventions for, for everyone, including some that were for teens or, or for even younger. And we looked at the effects of those interventions on not only maternal mortality, but also neonatal mortality. And one of the things that we found had the largest effect for neonatal mortality was actually education, primary school education, girls' education. And we found this in a, in a few different countries. Uh, the most famous is the, the Indonesia study by, by Esther Duflo. Um, but the, the model here is that if you keep girls in school longer, then that has two distinct pathways on reducing the likelihood that her child will die. One is that if she's in school, she's not engaging in other activities which may, lead, which may directly lead to, uh, to pregnancy. One. The second is that if she is in school, she is learning, and as a more learned, more educated mother, she can better navigate the world around her in favor of her small child. So we do, there, there is some evidence on it, but it's on those sort of extreme outcomes of mortality and neonatal mortality there. Well, thank you for those. I think those are most of the questions we have for now. Um, I 
especially appreciate this idea of using the gap map. I hope I got those words in the right order. Yes, the gap map um, to to really design what what we need to know. People run early childhood programs all over the world all the time, and um, I've shared the the gap map with several operational agencies to say who have asked us as a learning network what could we contribute to the field and I think it just lays out so clearly uh, the kind of things that um, that people could be studying. I am going to put up the links right now. Everyone will receive a follow-up email about 24 hours from now with all of the documents and a link to them. Um, but let me go ahead and put up a single slide that has the links. They are quite long, but if you go to, are people seeing just the slide, I hope? Um, there you go. If you just go to the CPC's page, we already have a page up for this webinar. Uh, and if you think that these links are too long, um, you just follow the the title, the headlines there. Go to News and Events and Webinars, and it will be the top webinar there. All of the presentations, we will, when the recording is ready, upload that there. For the first time, we have video, thanks to Laura and Jeff, and we're seeing the, their lovely faces as they discuss these issues with us. Um, Laura had also mentioned a document from the World Bank called Stepping Up Early Childhood Development, uh, Investing in Young Children for High Returns. This is a rather lengthy link to it, but we have also already uploaded that to the, um, the webinar page. Jeff and Laura, this was just terrific. I'm glad that we were able to convene again and we'll be able to share this into posterity. Um, this is just such a terrific study, set of studies that really points at what we know at this moment in time. And my hope is that five years from now we will be able to revisit this and have more robust evidence uh, covering more outcomes, covering more activities, and covering a better geographic spread. So that's a call to action for all of us. A reminder, Laura mentioned the ECD Action Network that was recently launched by the World Bank and UNICEF. That is a way that we can all get involved in this. And uh, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that we are making these uh, crucial investments at the right time that benefits all of society. Thank you so much for joining us again and have a good morning, afternoon, evening, or other, depending on where you are in the world. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks especially to you, Laura and Jeff. Have a great day. Thank you.